everybody. It's one o'clock and we're doing our Birmingham Museum Facebook Live program. It looks like we're going to be doing this every Thursday, so I hope you um, check in with us. We are, um, as you all probably know, painfully know, you're at home and we are also indoors and we thought um, this would be a good opportunity for us to talk about or bring up issues that we talk about all the time here in the museum field and, and you know, when we're working on the collection or different issues that come up. And sometimes we don't get a chance to really share that stuff with the public, but we thought this would be one way. So today's topic is dress reform in the women's rights movement. Now that sounds kind of, you know, boring, but can I get your attention if I say it involves corsets, bra burning, and um, kind of a host of other like anatomical issues. If you haven't got um, uh, a woman in your life right now, I can tell you right now that if your mother um, was in America during the 20th century, she was a victim in, a, in one way or other of the same kind of dress reform expectations that we're gonna talk about um, uh, that were a lot stronger during the Victorian period. Okay, so let's get right to it. So we're gonna be hitting also on some very interesting topics such as the Mormon prophet um, King Jesse, James Jesse Strang on Beaver Island because he's connected to dress reform and we have some women in Birmingham who have some very interesting dress reform stories. So um, let's just start off by saying what it is. When we're talking about dress reform, we're really saying that for centuries across multiple cultures, but we're especially focusing on American culture, women's roles were in many ways dictated by the garments that they wore. And who was in charge of the garments? Who was in charge of determining what was a, a appropriate garment? A lot of times it was not the women themselves. So I'm gonna um, invite Kate, uh, sorry, Donna <laughs> Casaselli to talk a little bit too because Donna, unlike me, knows what it's like to wear a corset and wear period dress. And um, all I can say is, uh, before I turn it over to you, is I wore a dress today, and, but I had a choice to do that. And sometimes I don't wear dresses, I wear pants instead. So uh, our world is a little bit different now. Anyway, Donna, take it away. Well, I actually worked uh, at the Henry Ford for quite some time and worked on the Firestone Farm in 1880s dress. And I worked at Daggett Farm in 1760s and at Giddings, uh, so I was more fancy, 1760s. But in all these roles, I did have to wear a corset and I had to work. So uh, I kind of have firsthand knowledge on the difficulties of the dress at the time, but also some of the benefits. Um, most people, when they think of corsets, they think they're purely evil. Um, and yes, they can be. I'm not gonna you know, argue that they are not, especially if you're tight lacing, which is the extreme corset wear where you bring in your waist so tight that you actually can start doing organ and scalpel damage to yourself. Is that where the, the phrase being tight laced comes from then? Part of that, but also uh, to be uh, to be uh, straight laced. Straight laced. Yeah, is to be morally erect. And a lot of people felt that women in corsets were morally erect too because uh, it held them up and held them to a higher standard. <laughs> so we have a corset right here, mm -hmm. and I know you can say a lot more about it more yeah. from an expert point of view, <laughs> someone who's worn something yeah. similar. Well, this is actually one of the nicer wearing corsets. This is still a fancier corset. It's silk and lace, so this probably would have been somebody going to a ball or in day dress. This is not a working corset, which is completely different, something different than what I was wearing at the farm. Um, a hourglass corset actually allows for a little bit more room in the ribs than a straight corset. Is that what this is? This is an hourglass okay. corset. Um, and as you can see, this one's a little bit shallower, so it gives a little bit more for the rounded tummy, um, 1860s. Uh, as the flatter tummies come in in the 1880s, 1890s, and 1900s, you see that corset coming all the way down and a lot more uncomfortable. So this one um, 
would have been a little bit easier to wear, but it's also shaped for tight lacing if this was worn by a tight lacer. Uh, because you can bring this in much tighter. So you want to play I'm going to show you the back. Okay. So this is the back. And as you can see, this is laced appropriate. Um, it has room in the back. This helps uh, take some of the pressure off the spine so you don't get those uh, spinal deformities. <laughs> um, there no, are deformities <laughs> of other kinds, <laughs> just not their spine. Okay, um, they have skeletons where they have the closed backs, and you can see that that little nub that comes out on your back was actually bent down. <laughs> okay. These kind of allow for the natural formation. Um, it also allows just for a little bit more. Now a tight lacer... I can show that, that photo. Oh yes. Should, should I do that while you're talking? Sure. Okay. And we can maybe put this image up on Facebook too. Go ahead. So a tight lacer would actually bring there, the desired was two-fifths. One-third of your waist size, basically two or three inches, wasn't enough. Uh, half would be unbelievable. So if you were uh, a 24, cutting it down to 12 is not going to be believable. The actual tight lacing uh, was a two or a three fifths tightening, two to fifth to three fifths tightening uh, to bring that waist even tinier. And um, in the photo that I just, this is an illustration from I believe the. Uh, latter part of the 19th century um, that a physician um, had put in a medical book. And this is the physician's comparison of the woman on the left is a normal woman without um, having her internal organs and rib cage affected by corset wear. And the woman on the right has been subjected to tight lacing. And um, what, although this is in, I think, German, I mean, it, you don't even have to read German to get this. Um, you see the ribs have been um, uh, misshapen and, and the internal organs, the soft organs, the kidney, the liver, the lungs are being pushed and scrunched in all these different ways. So the idea was this is bad for women. It's going to impair their health and as Donna uncovered, <laughs> You know, there, there were some actual, you were talking about some actual um, quotations about why tight corsets shouldn't be worn and the men's point of view about that. Um, men felt that women should not wear tight corsets uh, for their fertility. They believed that wearing tight corsets would cause damage to babies. And of course a woman uh, was expected to have lots of children at this time period. So when women cry out, don't tight lace because uh, it limits movements and it limits your freedom, men were like, oh no, 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 you know, don't tell women that. But what if men said, well, it could harm, you know, your offspring, well then everybody was like, oh, don't tight lace. Pay attention <laughs> because a man said it, so that right. makes it more true. Um, the other, uh, I think, angle here, we're talking, but we sort of jumped in, in the middle of the Victorian high, uh, high-end mm -hmm. corset wearing, let's say. Um, but the roots of dress reform, at least in America, really go back to the 1840s and 50s uh, to the temperance movement and the suffrage movement in northern New York. So you've heard of Susan B. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Um, and the culture in northern New York in, at the time in the 1840s and 50s was ripe for women to start thinking about, hey, I'm going to be educated. Hey, I'm, you know, going to have some rights that I've, that men have. Hey, maybe I don't want to wear these cumbersome clothing that get in my way when I'm just trying to be practical and, and live life. So, um, one of the women associated with that um, group was uh, Amelia Bloomer, and Amelia Bloomer was the editor of a woman's magazine called The Lily. And she was actually, it was a temperance magazine, that was her thing. However, she had heard about this kind of dress that was being promoted, it sort of started in France, and she advocated it and started publishing publication that gets the word out, right? So she was publishing photos of women in this outfit, and it began to be called, after her, 
This was called the bloomer outfit. And this outfit in the 1840s and 50s is the connection to the Mormon king of Beaver Island, Jesse Strang, believe it or not. <laughs> because in the mid 1850s, when the Mormon community on Beaver Island, which is in northern Michigan, uh, basically became the entire population of the island, or almost uh, totally, they began to set their own laws. Uh, one of the things they did was first they elected um, uh, Strang King, so he was king uh, of the island, and then they, he started enacting rules and laws, and he heard about the bloomer outfit, and he was, it was very appealing to him, probably because of the fecundity, fertility oh, issue, yes. <laughs> and it was simpler, and um, women could get more work done, and um, if they weren't dragging around heavy skirts. So he made it a rule, and um, that didn't go over really well with some members of the, of the uh, island um, community, and they resisted, and he wanted to have uh, the women and their husbands beaten for disobedience. So you can see that really went well. But anyway, that's the connection with um, James Jesse Strang. And if you but I would say, working at Firestone Farm, I would have loved the bloomers um, because the corset itself, like I said, we didn't wear these kind. We were, wore working corsets, which actually were quite comfortable. Um, and our period clothing uh, person upstairs said, if I ever hear anyone beat out of breath, I'll take your corset away <laughs> because she did not want us tight lacing. Um, and we wore wrappers, which you could, if you had a bad day, you could loosen it up. If you ate too much at lunch, you could loosen so it up. Why was it called a wrap? The wrappers were uh, designed uh, for working women. So these are something, uh, they were actually part of the dress reform too. Um, they were more flowing, uh, they tied at the waist, they weren't, they didn't have a set, tight, how, you know, so that it's a cute head fit. didn't have to fit into it. You didn't have to fit yeah, into it. Yeah, so, it. um, they were really great for working women, except for the length. Um, and the reason why I say I would, would have loved bloomers is that twice, while doing work at Firestone Farm, the corset never got in my way. It actually helped in some situations when you were doing really heavy labor. <laughs> so like, back brace. Yeah, it was like it was like working those back braces that they sell now, uh, which was great. But it was the skirts. The skirts were so heavy. We would have several petticoats and then these big skirts that went pretty much down to the ground. And one day we didn't have enough gentlemen on the farm, and it was we had to plop. And you know, where men would never go in and wash dishes in the 1880s, women would go out in the fields and plow yeah. because that had to get done. Yeah. And I'm pushing the plow and walking the plow, but I'm walking and my skirts are getting under and oh. I ripped the entire bottom oh. of my dress. Oh. <laughs> so that was the fun going up here in clothing going, ah, uh, I need a new dress. So those bloomers would have definitely given women more freedom mm -hmm to earn wages and I think that's what scared men is that now you're going to have women running around in trousers well what if they're running around in trousers and they're making money and they're making money and they're drinking and they're smoking and you know they're, they, they went out and then they'll just abandon their families and leave their kids that's at the right. wayside that's right. and, and then all those same uh, uh, objections could just be reused during the suffrage movement again. right <laughs> So we could just recycle those same objections to women getting the right to vote. And I did mention bra burning, I think, so I wanted to tie that in too. So that is one of those interesting uh, parts of the 1970s that people believe that feminist protests were bra burning ceremonies. And the truth is, there is no documented evidence that a bra was ever burnt as a, at a protest as part of an organized um, protest at all and yet we often talk about it but I can think of a lot of women who probably would have loved to burn their bras and there sure <laughs> were women and I you know I was a little bit younger then but I sort of remember parts of this I was in high school but I remember you know hearing all about this and going braless was this big thing like wow that's really out there you know, <laughs> you're really brave you know <laughs> Um, so, I mean, it had its moments, and I think um, that that's worth mentioning, that, that a lot of women now 
um, especially in the senior years, remember those years. And, and, and I, I think that's carried forward, but we still, the Equal Rights Amendment still hasn't been voted in, so <laughs> maybe there will be robbery again in the future, I don't know. Um, let's see, you also connected a really interesting story with the woman from Birmingham. Yes, so um, sadly, the duress reform of the early Seneca Falls and Bloomer, Amelia Bloomer, would die out. Um, it would pretty much die out because women were advocating for it. They were advocating for the freedom that it would bring. And that just, that just wasn't going to fly uh, because, you know, if women had the freedom to earn wages and walk around freely and, you know, be in control of their own bodies, well then, <gasps> gasp, they could vote, <laughs> you know? And it, so right. men had to squash that. You're not really going to see real dress reform until men start instituting it. And one of the bigger institutors of dress reform along with health reform was Kellogg. Yes, the Kellogg from Kellogg cereal here in Battle Creek. It was a health cereal. It was originally a health, health food like. Right. It was a health cereal and he would have a sanitarium, not a sanitarium. So his was a health resort not for tuberculosis patients. And Mary Utter, uh, one of our uh, members of Birmingham that go all the way back to, yes, the granddaughter of the other murders from last week. <laughs> she would visit Kellogg's uh, sanitarium and write back to the eccentric and many, some of her letters had been published in the eccentric through the eccentric, the Birmingham, the Birmingham eccentric. And she talked about her treatments at uh, Kellogg, uh, at the Kellogg Institute. And uh, Kellogg was big into dress reform. His wasn't necessarily dress reform for fertility or dress reform for freedom. His was dress reform for health. He was one of the few people who recognized that women had a different breathing pattern. Many people assumed it was because men breathed different from women because they were male versus female, that it was because of the sex, not because of the corset. Uh, so women um, breathed shallow and were able to, to, or they were more prone to fainting because they were women. And he was like, no, it has to do with the corset. We take the corset off, we take the weight mm -hmm. off, and we put them in these special tunics that you can still have the skirts, but instead of all the weight on the hips, which in 1870s, if you were to weigh a woman's dress outfit, you could add up to 25 pounds on her body. Right, so it's like carrying a baby with you up and down <laughs> yeah, up and doing so, all the laundry and everything else that you had to do. And so what he did is he created this undergarment that took that weight off the whole body but also took out the binding so there was no corsetry and women started to breathe normal like with their lower lungs instead of their upper lungs. Uh, there have been modern um, experiments done and they show that women lose uh, on average 9% but up to 29% of their lung capacity with just a moderate corset on. Oh my gosh. So, <laughs> and, and you know, uh, I think we were, when uh, we were talking about this the other day a little bit, I mean, the first thing I thought of was consumption because consumption, which is tuberculosis, um, a lung disorder, I mean, a lot of women uh, became consumptive, and can you imagine if you were also in a trying to uh, dress like this? Um, so amazing. But, Let's see. Okay. But Ke oh, I was just gonna say, but Kellogg was not only concerned with women's dress reform; he was also concerned with men's dress reform. And his biggest one was men change your underwear each day. <laughs> please, <laughs> please. So I found that hilarious. That is women's dress reform. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and then uh, we, we just can't leave this topic without saying that our, you know, our founding mother, which uh, maybe is a misnomer, our founding matron, matron. Uh, <laughs> Martha Baldwin, uh, Maddie Baldwin, was at least the story that's come down is that she famously would ride around in her Surrey uh, 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 in her later years around in Birmingham, and she would refused to wear a corset which meant that she was created a scandal every time she went out in public. So, 
I guess at this point we can uh, turn over if there are any questions or comments. And if not, I guess um, anything else you want to yeah, add? Yeah, I was going to add that, you know, just, just to, one last to prove a point. Um, when women proposed dress reform or even tried to bring it into haute couture, uh, we have this beautiful dress. I love this dress. Uh, this is by Jeannie Paquin, uh, 1906, in La Mode. She was a couture designer. Uh, she would design that S curve, which the Gibson girl. I don't know if you've, you know, familiar with the Gibson girl, but in the 1900s, the Gibson girl became very popular, and the extreme S curve corset, which would force a woman's breast to pop out and her hips to push back, also known as the pigeon breast look. Um, oh, with the big bustling thing yeah. in the back. Um, yeah. She came out with this, as you can see, there's almost no waist to that. The bust is not pushed out. The butt is not pushed out. She's just standing normal and you can almost see that she can breathe. <laughs> However, what's funny is that she's not known for bringing back the empire waist. A gentleman named Paul Perrault, uh, poor, I'm not good with French. How's it spelled? Uh, P-O-I-R-E-T. Poiret, probably. He would be known for bringing back the empire waist, and he would be known for getting rid of the corset of designing outfits. Thank goodness he came to a rescue. And the funny thing is, is that they're gorgeous. I love his outfits. They're very innovative. But he doesn't really start designing these till 1911. How many years after Jeannie uh, starts Paquin. designing them? And Jeannie Paquin. And so even though she was the one that came out with that empire waist, the, the, the relief of the corset, that S shade, she's forgotten mm -hmm. and he's t touted as the man that did this the man that you know that liberated women and it's like well we've just documented that she existed so thank you very much yeah. for doing the research <laughs> <laughs> and you know he was also touted as uh designing the the harem pants but if you look really close they're a lot closer to the bloomers mm -hmm. and right uh so yeah it's just kind of interesting that uh, when women design it, it's bad. When men design it, it's good. Well, um, I'm so glad our world is different now. So um, <laughs> um, if, um, if there are no other questions, I think what we'll do is we'll wind this down for now. We want to thank you for joining us for our, our conversation and, you know, um, our uh, reminiscing about <laughs> all the wonderful things about women's clothing and dress. And I'm so glad that little girls can go to school in third grade this, these days and play softball if they want in pants. Because when I was in third grade, I had to wear a dress. To play softball, I had to bring shorts. <laughs> because we had to wear a dress every day. I mean, that was in my lifetime. And it, that was that's just a little bit of a trickle down of the same idea of um, the, the constraints of dress even in my life. So thanks for coming. See you next week. <laughs>